We're going to have a conversation about Omax Prosper because the Mavericks might have something on their hands here that's very intriguing. Now, Prosper has some really unique tools here, and I admit I was sleeping on him a little bit. Even this last video I did, I was not super descriptive in talking about him. I just said, you know, he's an intriguing piece. I kind of left it at that. But I'm really blown away by what I've seen from him so far in these summer league games. I haven't seen the games when they aired. I had to go back and watch bits and pieces of them after the fact. But everything that I see from him is leaping off the screen. Now, to be fair, it's summer league. We have to take that into consideration. But his his tool set, his skills look like they have the potential to translate not just in the sense that he could be a rotation player. I think this could be a, a very nice long-term piece for you, part of your core group moving forward into this future here. And that's a great pickup at number 24. Like That is a very special pickup that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find. Again, I love what the Mavericks have done the last two, yeah, two drafts. Um, as far as what they've been able to get, the prospects, they've been able to get some of the trades that they've made because my focus had been more on Derek Lively and for understandable reasons. And again, there's plenty I could talk about on his front as well. The Tyson Chandler comparisons, even from Tyson himself talking about that is very cool to see. But Omax is who is really summoning my attention here. This is a guy who some people wanted to say he's kind of like a like his comp is sort of like a Dorian Finney Smith. I think it's more ambitious than that. I really do. We're talking about a guy who came in and he wasn't able to play much in the first summer league game, but he's averaging 11.3 points, 5.7 boards, uh, 1.3 assists. I haven't pulled up here in about 25 minutes per game while shooting 40% from the floor and 36%. From three, also 73, almost 74% at the line, which because of how the team shot free throws last year, particularly stands out. So you're talking about a guy who has an ability to create his own shot a little bit. It's not going to be anything insane. Obviously, the highlight game everyone's really looking at is his 18.5 rebound game where he was seven of 12 in the field. That's about 56, no, 58%. It's not 60. I can do basic math to that extent. Um, but he has really good athleticism. He's a versatile defender. And I see a lot of potential with that. He also had a 17 and 10 game against the Warriors with three steals, um, which is really, really nice as well. So you're seeing a guy who's pretty complete, a guy who by his own admission will do whatever it takes to make an impact. So it's a very, very unique here. And as much as everybody is looking at this and I get it. Everyone uh, wants to look at lively and there's good reason for that. But I do think Dallas might in some respect have gotten themselves, not something of more need because obviously the center position is still a very big need. You're not going to put a rookie in heavy minutes rotation. there. certainly not going to be starting him regularly. If you're going to try and do something right now, uh, referring to lively. So you, your need is still greater at the center position but I think once you have that address, whether it's letting Lively kind of grow into the role over two or three seasons uh, or bringing in a stopgap center, which yeah, I'm, I'm getting a little bit concerned about that at this point, whichever of those you do, once that's addressed, your greater need, your greater focus is those versatile defenders, those guys who can guard multiple positions, can cause fits, and can create a little bit for themselves, show great athleticism, great slashing ability. And you have all of that here with Omax. And it's really, really special to, to have that kind of player on your team. And to get him at number 24, I think is all the better. I think this is a, a home run pick for the Mavericks here. Grant Abseth on Twitter talks about uh, how much he's impressed during summer league basically saying he's playing, has all the makings and displaying the makings of a versatile defender with a upside beyond simply three and D, which is kind of what I've been beating around the bush a little bit here. He's done it in a more succinct way. So credit to Grant there. 
He's a great writer and a great journalist for this case. He's got a real impact here that I think could translate even into the immediate upcoming season. And that is fantastic because while I think there's going to be a role for Derek Lively, and I think there's certainly reason to be hyped about him as well. It's not like it's, well, okay, Omax is better than we thought. Should we cool our expectations a little bit on Lively? I think the style of play and what they're doing is kind of what it boils down to. The two-man game we've seen at times with Lively and Jaden Hardy is interesting, although Hardy had a very uh, ho-hum summer league. That's all true. But I think Omax is a fantastic pickup at 24, and the fact that you're now looking at this potential to drop him in and be a, a big piece of the rotation, I think, in literally year one, that's phenomenal value to find in the back end there. Now, I know, obviously, Jaden Hardy um, was found late. But even still, there's a lot of young talent on this team. And while everybody has been previously, until recent days, talking about Jaden, of course, and Derek Lively, it very much looks like they should be talking a lot more about Prosper. And uh, I'm glad to see that kind of changing here. Because even Jared Dudley, who's been coaching the Mavericks um, summer league team is really talking about like, yeah, you know what? He's really finding his way into this. Like initially they didn't play him a whole lot in that opener um, because he was only available. I think like one practice before that opening game against OKC, you know, part of that was just the trade finalizing and everything, but you also have then the consideration of um, just kind of working his way in and earning that role. And he has done everything to that Dudley talking about him after that game, uh, not that game, but talking about him after uh, a big performance that he had was basically like he either takes catch and shoot threes or gets downhill. He has great versatility guarding. He basically just is seeing him as a uh, aggressive downhill player, the slashing ability, the, the drive to get to the basket. That's, that's very good. That's something the Mavericks have not had enough of. Of. They have too many guys standing around the perimeter waiting for catch and shoot three point attempts. Of course, you have Kyrie and Luca who can get there, but you don't have enough other guys who are able to really create. Jaden Hardy was able to kind of finally late in the season last year carve out that role for himself just because they were so starved for it. They didn't really have the luxury of being like, ah, no, nah, keep him down specifically with the G League team with the legends and uh, do all of that. It's like, no, you're you're gonna have to give him these very real opportunities because you got no one else who can do it and you have to have that. You got to have these guys who can make these hustle plays. Obviously part of why people look at the Dorian Finney Smith com comparisons very much in line with that too. Versatile defender can guard multiple positions, uh, can be a good three point shooter has the makings of a three and D guy also has heart and hustle, but he can put the ball in the deck better and slash better than Dorian, I think. I, I see that ceiling being higher. So Kirk Henderson, formerly of Maps Moneyball, there you go, uh, ha had a great um, explanation on that on Twitter as well, talking about like, I think the people who are looking there are looking, they're, look, they're not looking high enough, essentially. They're looking at him, they're seeing Dorian. I think it's more than that. I'm right there with him. Again, small sample size, summer league can be anything, but it's worth taking into consideration here. He has real potential, I think, to be a, a nice piece with this team for the next several years. And he's playing his way into it. He's not giving you much of a choice if you're a coach, but to play him. That's something that Dorian did with Rick Carlisle. Again, the comp. And uh, that's why you now are seeing that with Dudley, who kind of saw after how he and Lively were making their presence felt in some of those early games. Like, yeah, you know what? Okay, they're going to get themselves some more minutes because they both have wowed in, the, in those opportunities. So the versatility, great. Love to see it. I also love to see that he's got more to his offensive game than I knew coming out. Coming out, I just saw the defense and the versatility there, and I was like, yeah, okay, maybe he can be a 3 and D guy. Maybe he can offer you a little something there, but I just don't know. Uh, the, the corner, 
the corner shooting potential is there as well. And that's a shot that Dallas opens up like crazy, particularly Luka Doncic opens up like crazy for his teammates. So if you got a guy that can be nails in that corner, like Dorian used to be the Dorian corner, uh, then you've got real ability. You got someone who's aggressive, someone who will attack and not just wait passively around again. Love it all. Love it. And I love a guy who's willing to get to the basket draw the contact, and then go to the line and be a respectable free throw shooter to convert it. All that's great. Love the value at pick 24. One more note I want to add to that real quick. Another thing that I'm I intrigued by, by his his skill set and athleticism that we see, we've been screaming for years about wanting the Mavericks to, with Luka Doncic, why would you not run more of a transition game? Dallas has been one of the slowest paced teams, always setting up half-court offense stuff, never pushing the pace. And part of that we always thought was just Luca's own conditioning. If Luca really is committed to getting into better shape like he was year two, then that's a good sign because you're now acquiring these guys who can run the floor and do something. Rashawn Holmes in particular, he had a great floor runner there. I see it similar uh, capabilities with Lively and with Prosper here. You're building yourself a roster of guys who can run the floor and get you easy baskets, and you've got a absolute star-studded generational talent point guard who can make the most impossible, inexplicable passes of anyone in the league. I, I He makes passes, Luca does, that I don't know if anyone else in the league can make the same pass or if you're talking a name or two. It's like... All right, maybe, maybe they're comparable, but they're not. They're certainly not noticeably different. They're not noticeably better. Luca is as good or better than anybody in the league at doing that. So you mix all those skill sets with those kind of athletes who can run the floor and convert for you. You have a very good recipe to finally get easy baskets and do something we've been begging you to do with this team for years. For years. So if you squander it now, you're never going to learn your lesson because you finally have the horses to run the race. All you got to do is put it into play, put it into the mix and get your get yourself where you don't have to rely purely on half court sets. Other Maverick notes here. It seems that Tim Hardaway Jr. for the moment might actually be here in Dallas to stay. Mark Cuban talking about that. Mavs governor. That's still a strange term for me to use every now and then uh, Mavs governor, Mark Cuban talking about how uh, Hardaway is here. He's been on the trading block for who, who knows how long, but the Mavericks were exploring at one point, a trade with the Pistons that was centered around Bohan Bogdanovich uh, and Killian Hayes in exchange for Tim Hardaway jr. And JaVale McGee. Holy crap. Do I do that deal like that? I don't know why I snapped twice. I think it's just cause I'm that eager to take the deal. This is uh, from a story from Tim Cato, quote, league sources say that talks were sturdy enough to discuss a potential trade framework. Uh, Bogdanovich and Killian Hayes coming to Dallas, Tim Hardaway Jr. and JaVale McGee going out, but it's unclear what else would have been required from each party to expand it to a four-team deal and what ultimately caused those talks, however serious, to stall. So... Mavericks have been interested in Bogdanovich for a while. There was smoke there before the draft. People talking about like, well, what if Dallas is going to trade pick 10 for Bogdanovich? And I would have hated that for the record. That's one of those things before I even came back when I saw that story, I just was grumbling and I was like, I swear if that's what they do with pick 10, I'm going to be so mad. So I'm really glad with how they've done it for the most part, how they've handled this off season. Um, there are some very head scratching moves. I really don't get them using their MLE the way they did. I, I don't understand it either. They are the smartest people in the room as they have thought for years. Granted new, you know, new administration, so to speak here, new front office outside of Cuban the last couple of years. But that has was so long been the problem of the Mavericks is just assuming they know best and that they're the only ones who really see the value and understand how the game is played here. I don't like how they use that MLE, but if you had been able to pull off this deal, getting off of the JaVale McGee contract, which was baffling when it happened and bringing in um, Bogdanovich and Hayes. I would have loved that. I think that would have been a phenomenal upgrade to your roster. 
And now without it, we'll see what happens. I'm hoping that something can still be revisited, but the Mavericks are kind of making it sound like they're largely content with where they're at. And I'm hoping if that's the case, if they're insistent upon that, that it's either just, "Mm, we're going to say this publicly, but we're going to keep, you know, working in the background to see what we can figure out, but we don't want to sound desperate. So that teams try to hardball us or, we're already thinking about the trade deadline for the next move because while the Mavericks have made some very good moves here, while they have made some trades that I am excited about, brought in some talent that I love the upgrades there, Rashawn Holmes in particular is a very intriguing pickup to me. I don't, I don't like some of these other moves. Some of these other moves leave me scratching my head. Um, And, you know, you just have to kind of hope that, those might be Hail Marys a little bit, and I don't know that all of them needed to be Hail Mary. Some of them feel like they could have been used in a more conventional way, something that's not saying like, yeah, but if he were to if he were to reach his potential or if he were to actually realize that potential a little bit better with us, unlike he's been able to do before, then hey, maybe this is a great pickup. Like a shot in the dark isn't really what you want to do in these situations. You want to be a little bit more scientific with your approach rather than wishful thinking. And I kind of get the feeling that they've made multiple moves now that feel more like wishful thinking and like, ah, did this, has this worked for anyone else? Has this worked with this guy uh, at any other place, any other stop? Well, no. And anyone who thinks it can is a fool, but maybe it'll work for us. Like, that's kind of the vibe I get from this. Elsewhere, we have talks of interest in Derek Jones Jr. Now, again, this is another one of these things that, um, you know, I'm aware of Jones Jr. a little bit. His athleticism leaps off this uh, leaps off the screen when in, whenever you're watching him. That's great. And I'm certainly in favor of adding guys like that who can bring that kind of athleticism to the table. And I know the Mavericks have been interested him in, in him in the past when they tried to make a deal that would have, back when he was with Miami, would have brought in Goran Dragic that fell through. And it sounds like it fell through because the Mavericks thought Jones Jr. was going to be in the deal. I, I'm trying to remember the exact details of that. That was like three years ago, which feels like an eternity ago. But um, the Mavericks have been interested in him for a while. Uh, again, this is from Newly Alex on Twitter. I like his little breakdown here, uh, just his way of talking about Derek Jones Jr., the player, and the potential that would bring. He said he would bring much needed depth on the wing, and he could also play some minutes at the small ball five. He ranked in the hundredth percentile when it came to defensive versatility. That made my eyes pop. <laughs> like that was the thing that I saw that I was like, I'll admit. I was not very familiar with that part of his game. I knew he was a good defender. I didn't realize the versatility thing to that extent. That is the part where I was like, you know what? I get it. I get it. All I really knew before was the athleticism, um, you know, the dunking ability, things like that, the slashing. I didn't know or at least have a great enough appreciation, I don't think, for what he's able to bring to the table defensively because that is by far his strongest, uh, most viable to this team asset that he would bring. So kudos for that. Uh, If he actually has a path to Dallas and they can get him here and he wants to be here, I'm all for it. But I don't know what that looks like. If it's just interest and it's out there and we're just kind of hoping that it can become something, then might be a tough shot. Here's some more stats digging deeper. Oh, look at that again. Newly Alex. That's a coincidence. Um, so he's talking about stats for Derek Jones Jr. from last season. I thought he was an okay three point shooter, but it's actually corner threes. Again, what we talked about earlier with the Mavericks, how they create those looks, particularly Luca, and how that's a very, very uh, viable asset for this team in particular. Why that is almost more what you need to look at when you're looking at a guy's three point percentage overall. Focus on what he does on catch and shoot and focus on what he does on corner threes last year he was 36.7 percent from corner threes, so certainly just a tick above average there but solid like now modern nba you're gonna say like 34 35 percent 
um, is about average. So he's a tick above that and solid there. Again, Luca will create the most wide open looks, at least six feet of space or more between the defender and the guy getting the look at the shot. He creates more of those looks than basically anyone. So you're already a good corner three point specialist. Good. Luca should be able to take you to another level by getting you a whole new degree of separation. He was, we already talked about that hundredth percentile in defensive versatility. He guarded centers and power forwards 46.1% of the time he was on the floor. True shooting percentage of 62.9%. And uh, again, this is one of those stats I wouldn't have even really thought to dig in too much. So credit to newly Alex on that generated 1.36% points per possession on pick and rolls as the roll man 100th percentile yeah that's uh all of that i i want that <laughs> I, I am interested in adding that to this team that is credit to him that's advanced stats that i did not have on Derek jones jr so even when i heard the name and heard the idea i was like yeah that'd be a pretty nice ad i i wouldn't hate that and then once you started looking at it deeper, it was like, oh, no, I definitely want that. I definitely want that guy on my team. So credit to, to Alex there. Jumping now, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but I do want to give it a little bit of love here just to round out this video. Tyson Chandler talking about seeing Derek Lively Jr. as kind of a, a younger him in many respects. Chandler talking about how he wants him to be better than he was. That's pretty high praise. This is an article from Dalton Trigg. We know what Tyson Chandler was to the Mavericks. He was the missing piece that helped them go from a basically perennial first or second round bounce to the NBA champions that they ended up becoming in 2011. It's a travesty that he was treated the way he was after all of that, not once, but twice with Dallas. I'm actually kind of shocked he's part of the coaching staff now. I would not have guessed that. I'm thrilled that Tyson is around and in some capacity still with the team. Obviously, that's the Jason Kidd thing and the Dirk thing. But yeah, I'm, I'm a little shocked by that because they kind of did him dirty not once but twice. Anyway, in all of this, we know Tyson didn't have an offensive game. He was a guy that you didn't have to set plays for or anything. He was just a fiery leader, heart and soul, passion, effort, hustle, all of that. And uh, a phenomenal, phenomenal athlete. Tyson, honestly, if it weren't for the injuries throughout his career, if his prime years had been longer and like better, and it sounds funny to say it that way, better because of health, I think he could have been a, a Hall of Famer. Now, basketball Hall of Fame, a little bit different. I don't. Maybe he'll still get there because his accolades post-title very much changed how he was perceived for a span of about four or five years. But it's uh. It's high praise to to talk about that and say, you know, I see, I see what he has the potential to be, and I want him to be better than that. So lively talking about Tyson's mentorship says, "quote Man, it's honestly amazing. You know, I've never actually been coached by a big. I've never been coached by someone who's a seven footer, somebody who's been in the game, who knows the details, the tricks, the nitty gritty things." Just being able to be in games, be in practices, and having somebody to ask questions, ask about timing, ask about footwork, ask about when to do something and when not to, it's just a great asset to have. Being able to have him in my, in my corner right now, I'm just so grateful. I'm just going to take advantage of it daily. Love the mentality from the kid. I really do. And uh, it seems like Tyson is equally high on this kid's potential. He's talking about him saying, quote, I want him to be better than me, to be honest. I'm trying to teach him the things that I learned later and during the course of my career, trying, trying to shorten his learning curve, but I see a lot of great things. I love his attitude. He's willing to learn. He comes in with great spirit every day, works really hard, and is a really good teammate. Tyson's leadership was a big part of what separated him from that. I think it's the culture change he brought when he came to Dallas uh, that turned that team around. Yes, of course, we saw the effort on, on, on the court, what he was able to do, hustling, 
diving for loose balls, the tip out rebounds and everything that he was able to extend possessions with those kind of offensive rebounds. And we've seen lively doing some of those back tap offensive rebounds as well. Those are great when they work. Um, I, I love them when they work, but you got to have awareness of what's going on behind you there. Cause you do it wrong and you're sending the other team the other way on a fast break. But even still it's uh it's really Tyson's culture change thing that I think helped Dallas take that. And in places where they weren't competitive because they were bad teams, i.e. Charlotte, um, the Knicks, when, you know, I know obviously Tyson got there, it turned around for a couple of years and then it kind of went into the tank and then they traded Tyson back to Dallas. But even with that, when the, when the teams were bad, Tyson's demand for hustle effort and full, you know, full unbridled passion and energy of his teammates demanding that of them, he became viewed in a negative respect. But if the team was bad and the culture was bad and no one was willing to fight and try and rise to his level, then they viewed it as a problem. But if you dropped him in the right position, the, not, the right situation as Dallas ended up being, and for a couple of years there, New York was as well, then he can be a great asset because then he's taking a very talented team and he's bringing them up to a new level and that helps them reach new heights. That's that's all very, very interesting to, to look at and to consider. So if he's able to have that sort of thing here and you're seeing similar characteristics, not just on the floor, but even kind of off the floor a little bit with Lively, that's great. Tyson says he's looking at himself all over again. He says it's crazy. Like he, it actually sparks energy within me seeing him and remembering where I was at that time. He has everything in front of him right now. So you're talking about a guy who has shown off elite defensive instincts, communication skills. That's been the thing that really jumped off uh, the page for me watching Lively in Summer League is not just the effort, not just the instincts, but his his communication. Like It's Summer League, and he is so loud and vocal communicating with his teammates, giving out instructions, letting guys know when he's got their help, rotating. Like It has been very positive to see. And if he can bring that kind of focus and intensity and attention to detail to the floor night in, night out, then you have everything you're looking for. Dallas has looked for a new Tyson Chandler pretty much the mo- since the moment Tyson uh, was signed and traded away to New York following the title. And if you have that now and you have Tyson here to actually like you know, work with him, mentor him, bring him along, develop him, all of that, then man, that's a great place to be because you get that locked down, you get that position locked down for the foreseeable future. And you've got a lot of things to be very happy about with this team moving forward. I love the, the turn towards the youth with this team, because it doesn't feel like they're taking a step back where they're like, Hey man, we know, we're going to be a couple of years away because we have to figure all of this stuff out. It's not just looking at it in that respect. It's also looking at it and saying, we're not yielding where we're at. We're still trying to keep our high level talent, but we also recognize that we've been an older team for a little while. We need to get more young guys in here and develop them with these other primo talented players so that we can, you know, basically have not just a, a small window of time where we're looking at maybe a two or three year window, but hopefully opening it up more so where you have more depth, more talent, particularly talent on rookie deals where you have more flexibility to really do something. But that does it for this episode here. I don't actually have a whole lot yet to dive into on Jaden Hardy, but let me know in the comments. Are you worried at all with Jaden Hardy struggling, uh, his field goal efficiency struggling in the summer league? Is this an aberration, or do you think this is a case of a guy who he can be a high scorer, but he's always going to be a guy that's got to get a lot of shots up to get his points? Is he going to be a guy taking a ton of shots every time, or is it a guy that you're going to have to repackage into a new role where you try to use him more as a catch and shoot three point shooter um, who can create, but isn't going to be as aggressive in doing other things. Let me know in the comments. How do you, how do you view Jaden Hardy summer league run? Do the Mavericks need to have at least some degree of concern there? Or is this something where it's just too small of a sample size? 
I'll be back soon. Don't forget to like the video, drop a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.